To his horror, he recollected that he had left both coat and waistcoat behind him in his, in his cell, and with them his pocketbook, money, keys, watch, matches, pencil case, all that makes life worth living, all that distinguishes the many-pocketed animal, the lord of creation, from the inferior one-pocketed or no-pocketed productions that hop or trip about permissively, unequipped for the real contest. In his misery, he made one desperate effort to carry the thing off, and with a return to his fine old manner, a blend of the squire and the college don, he said, Look here, I find I've left my purse behind. Just give me that ticket, will you, and I'll send the money on tomorrow. I'm well known in these parts. The clerk stared at him and the rusty black bonnet a moment, and then laughed. I should think you were pretty well known in these parts, he said, if you've tried this game on often. Here, stand away from the window, please, madam. You're obstructing the other passengers. An old gentleman who had been prodding him in the back for some moments here thrust him away and what was worse addressed him as his good woman, which angered Toad more than anything that had occurred that evening. Baffled and full of despair, he wandered blindly down the platform where the train was standing and tears trickled down each side of his nose. It was hard, he thought, to be within sight of safety and almost of home and to be bulked by the want of a few wretched shillings and by the pettifogging mistrustfulness of paid officials. Very soon his escape would be discovered, the hunt would be up and he would be caught, reviled, loaded with chains, dragged back again to prison and bread and water and straw. His guards and penalties would be doubled and oh what sarcastic remarks the girl would make. What was to be done? He was not swift of foot, his figure was unfortunately recognisable. Could he not squeeze under the seat of a carriage? He had seen this method adopted by schoolboys when the journey money provided by thoughtful parents had been diverted to other and better ends. As he pondered, he found himself opposite the engine which, which was being oiled, wiped and generally caressed by its affectionate driver, a burly man with an oil can in one hand and a lump of cotton waste in the other. "'Hello, mother,' said the engine driver. "'What's the trouble?' You don't look particularly cheerful. Oh, sir, said Toad, crying afresh, I am a poor and happy washerwoman and I've lost all my money and can't pay for a ticket and I must get home tonight somehow and whatever am I to do, I don't know. Oh, dear, oh, dear. That's a bad business indeed, said the engine driver reflectively. Lost your money and can't get home and got some kids too waiting for you, I dare say. Any amount of them, sobbed Toad, and they'll be hungry and playing with matches and upsetting lamps, the little innocents, and quarrelling and going on generally. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, said the good engine driver. You're a washerwoman to your trade, says you. Very well, that's that, and I'm an engine driver, as you well may see. And there's no denying it's terribly dirty work. Uses up a power of shirts, it does, till my missus is fair tired of washing them. If you'll wash a few shirts for me when you get home and send them along, I'll give you a ride on my engine. It's against the company's regulations, but we're not so very particular in these out-of-the-way parts. The toad's misery turned into rapture as he eagerly scrambled up into the cab of the engine. Of course, he had never washed a shirt in his life and couldn't if he tried. And anyhow, he wasn't going to begin. But he thought, when I get safely home to Toad Hall and have money again and pockets to put it in, I will send the engine driver enough to pay for quite a quantity of washing and that will be the same thing or better. The guard waved his welcome flag, the engine driver whistled in cheerful response and the train moved out of the station. 
As the speed increased and the toad could see on either side of him real fields and trees and hedges and cows and horses all flying past him, and as he thought how every minute was bringing him nearer to Toad Hall and sympathetic friends and money to clink in his pocket and a soft bed to sleep in and good things to eat and praise and admiration for the recital of his adventures and his surpassing cleverness, he began to skip up and down and shout and sing snatches of song to the great astonishment of the engine driver who had come across washerwomen before at long intervals but never one at all like this. They had covered many a mile and Toad was already considering what he would have for supper as soon as he got home when he noticed that the engine driver, with a puzzled expression on his face, was leaning over the side of the engine and listening hard. Then he saw him climb onto the coals and gaze out over the top of the train. Then he, tur he, he returned and said to Toad, It's very strange. We're the last train running in this direction tonight, yet I could be sworn that I heard another following us. Toad ceased his frivolous antics at once. He became grave and depressed and a dull pain in the lower part of his spine communicating itself to his legs made him want to sit down and try desperately not to think of all the possibilities. By this time the moon was shining brightly and the engine driver steadying himself on the coal could command a view of the line behind them for a long distance. Presently he called out, I can see it clearly now. It's an engine on our rails, coming along at a great pace. It looks as if we were being pursued. The miserable toad, crouching in the coal dust, tried hard to think of something to do with dismal want of success. They are gaining on us fast, cried the engine driver. And the engine is crowded with, a, with the queerest lot of people. Men like ancient warders waving halberds, policemen in their helmets waving truncheons, and shabbily dressed men in pot hats, obvious and unmistakable plainclothes detectives, even at this distance, waving revolvers and walking sticks, all waving and all shouting the same thing. Stop! 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 Then Toad fell on his knees among the coals and raising his clasped paws in supplication cried, Save me, only save me, dear kind Mr Engine Driver, and I will confess everything. I am not a simple washerwoman, I see... Uh, I'm not, a, I'm not the simple washerwoman I seem to be. I have no children waiting for me, innocent or un otherwise. I am a toad, the well-known and popular Mr Toad, a landed proprietor. I have just escaped by my great daring and cleverness from a loathsome dungeon into which my enemies had flung me. And if those fellows on that engine recapture me, it will be chains and bread and water and straw and misery once more for poor, unhappy, innocent toad. The engine driver looked down upon him very sternly and said, Now tell the truth. What were you put in prison for? It was nothing very much, said poor Toad, colouring deeply. I only borrowed a motor car while the owners were at lunch. They had no need of it at the time. I didn't mean to steal it. Really, but people, especially magistrates, take such harsh views of thoughtless and high-spirited actions. The engine driver looked very grave and said, I fear that you have been indeed a wicked Toad, and by rights I ought to give you up to offended justice. But you are evidently in sore trouble and distress, so I will not desert you. I don't hold with motor cars for one thing, and I don't hold with being ordered about by policemen when, when I'm on my own engine for another. And the sight of an animal in tears always makes me feel queer and soft-hearted. So cheer up, Toad. I'll do my best, and we may beat them yet. They piled on more coals, shoveling furiously. The furnace roared, the sparks flew, the engine leapt and swung, but still their pursuers g slowly gained. The engine driver, with a, with a sigh, wiped his brow with a handful of cotton waste and said, I'm afraid it's no good, Toad. You, you see, they are running light and they have the better engine. There's just one thing left for us to do, and it's your only chance, so attend very carefully to what I tell you. A short way ahead of us is a long tunnel, and on the other side of that the line passes through a thick wood. 
Now, I will put on all speed I can while we are running through the tunnel. But the other fellows will slow down a bit, naturally, for fear of an accident. When we are through, I will shut off steam and put on brakes as hard as I can. And the moment it's safe to do so, you must jump and hide in the wood before they get through the tunnel and see you. Then I will go full speed ahead again and they can chase me if they like for as long as they like and as far as they like. Now mind and be ready to jump when I tell you. They piled on more coals and the train shot into the tunnel and the engine rushed and roared and rattled till at last they shot out the other end into fresh air and the peaceful moonlight and saw the wood lying dark and helpful upon either side of the line. The driver shut off steam and put on the brakes. The toad got down on the step and as the train slowed down to almost a walking pace he heard the driver call out, Now jump! Toad jumped rolled down a short embankment, picked himself up unhurt, scrambled into the wood and hid.